Have you been deceived? Are you being deceived by the many pundits out there? By that I mean, are you being deceived by the faith alone, trust in the merits of Christ's substitution gospel, where they use the cross to effect a provision whereby you enter into this position with Christ that you're forgiven by means of some kind of satisfaction being made on the cross, instead of entering into a covenant with Christ in an abiding state of faithfulness and purity of heart. Which is it? Well, I don't see too much real repenting going on out there on the streets. I don't see anything being really effectively convict convicting and convincing the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, or anyone arguing the gospel from the aspect of righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, like we see in the book of Acts. Many of them want to bring the genie out of the bottle with all these apostolic signs and wonders that turn out to just to be uh, deceiving spirits and sleight of hand and spinning of yarns, but they never seem to get to the point of arguing for the purpose of the gospel, to redeem man from the corrupting influence of sin. See, the whole thing was to covenant was to come to put an end to sin. Wasn't that what the 70th week of Daniel was about, that he would establish with, with the people? He put an end to iniquity. Well, how can you put an end to iniquity when iniquity is still in the world? You put an end to it in the human heart by going to the root of bitterness or the root of rebellion and rooting that out in repentance. And that's what's happened with this fake gospel that's being preached. This gospel of redemption that's not redemption at all. It's free forgiveness offered past, present, and future with the provision that you always have First John 1, 9 as your standard for any sins that you may commit when you reoffend. See, the reoffense is of no consequence in the sense that because the provision has it covered. So it's not a serious offense to reoffend, crucify him again, hold him up for open shame, trample the spirit of grace. No, that's not a serious offense because, well, he's the advocate. we have an advocate with the Father. Well, see, that's not what the scriptures teach. Faith, grace, and redemption have been totally redefined from the dynamic process that it's supposed to bring about through grace, faith, and redemption to leave man still in bondage to sin. They never seem to get to that point of freeing man from the corrupting influence of sin. And the problem is, is they want to receive the grace of God, but they're receiving it in vain. So you can go through this whole entire scheme that we'll cover here. The grace that's appeared to all men, the free gift, the, free, the freely forgiven sins, the exceeding great and precious promises, the remission by the blood, the hope of eternal life, the redemption by faith, freely forgiven with redemption by faith in Christ, justification. You can go through the whole scheme, but yet receive it in vain, just like 2 Corinthians talks about. When he talks about the reconciliation that was worked in Christ, starting out for the love of Christ constrains us because we judge this, that if one died for all, then all died. See, so therefore, he says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, and old things have passed away, and all things become new. You don't get reconciled and justified in your former state of ungodliness. That's not what Romans 4 is talking about. Abraham was not justified in his sins are in an ungodly state, as your preachers and Bible teachers are saying out there. See, they've taken the gospel of what must I do to be saved to what's been done and trust in that. It's no longer people pricked to the heart and crying out to God, what must I do? And then come clean in repentance. No, it's what's been done for you, the wonderful plan that God has for your life, or receive and trust, or babble off in some incoherent language and think that the Spirit has been on you. Well, if there's no period of heart, there's no spirit. If there's no conviction of sin, there's no spirit, folks. Well, he talks about the reconciliation in verses 18 through 21. And he says that, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be ye reconciled to God. So this, reconcil this great re gift of reconciliation is offered through the grace that has appeared to all men and the redemption that's available in Christ Jesus and the past free forgiveness of past sins. But you have to be reconciled, returned to favor with God through this faith. See, that's the problem with faith alone. There is no such thing as faith alone, trust alone. 
Faith can't be alone because the very definition of faith is faithfulness and fidelity. The very definition of faith about Abraham in the Old Testament is firm and established with God. When it says Abraham believed God and was accounted unto him as righteousness in Genesis 15, 6, it means in the Hebrew that he was firmly established with God because he walked in the steps of faith, he did the deeds of faith, therefore he was reckoned righteous by such faith. Faithfulness from Genesis 12 to 15, we see recorded for us in the line of the faithful. Just like reckoning in English. See, imputed, imputed righteousness is not a word. Imputed is a legal term that the translators put into the King James Version in most of the modern versions to imply that something's imputed to your account that you, that, in, that you didn't have before. So his righteousness is imputed to you. In other words, it's transfer, his virtues transfer. It's not what that means at all. The word in the, in the scriptures is legizomai, meaning reckoned or accounted, and it's the same as the word, almost the same as the word reckoned in English. Reckoned in English means to establish by accounting. In other words, you establish something by accounting it, weighing it in the balance of the accounting and declaring it to be just and right. That's what happened with Abraham's faith. That's the reason there's no such thing as faith alone. And the reason Romans uh, 4, 3, and 4 does not teach that man is justified in his sins or in his ungodly state. He that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, it's talking about the works of circumcision, in ritual, in sacrifice. It's not talking about the moral imperative behind faithfulness to God. That's the key here. So that's the reason you don't see a lot of real repenting going on. That's the reason you don't hear him saying that faith upholds and establishes the law, that it purifies the heart by faith and it works by love. That's the reason you don't hear that from these pundits. Because to them, faith is the end all, save all, you're in Christ, and that's the end of it. Because it's a positional righteousness to them, based on some kind of satisfaction or payment, depending on which side of the coin you're on in the atonement theology, that established you in Christ. Instead of you being established by accounting through a faithfulness that came through a repentance, proven by deeds. No, no, it's, it's you declared righteous. See, the whole thing is to be released from bondage. Faith, grace, and redemption equals a release from bondage in which the rebellion of the heart ceases once for all. That's what we say when we're talking about sin ceasing. We're, talking of, we're not talking about coming to a perfect knowledge of all things when you enter into Christ. You've got to grow in grace and knowledge. We're talking about the rebellion ceases. The root of sin is cut off. The root of rebellion. There is no one in Christ in a sin-repent cycle of ongoing sin, sins of rebellion and unfaithfulness and willful sin. It, it, it's, that's not, it, the scripture don't teach that. No, in Christ is a, an abiding state of faithfulness based on purity of heart. That's the covenant in Christ that is wrought through this redemption because the rebellion ceases once for all. Just like Peter says in 1 Peter 4, he who has suffered with Christ, put on this same mind, for he who has suffered with him has ceased from sin. Well, suffered in what? Well, suffered in the godly sorrow of repentance, the brokenness, the clearing of wrongdoing, the putting away of the sins in your life, the, like I say, the, the, the sins of rebellion. The root of rebellion has got to be rooted out before redemption can take place. That's just, that's just plain and simple. See, Faith is what? Substance and evidence. Substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Then it goes into the faith chapter of Hebrews 11. Well, if it's substance and evidence, that can't be alone. In, even that, even that brief definition that it gives in Hebrews 11.1 1, cannot be faith alone. No, faith worketh by love. It purifies the heart of sin by obedience to the truth. That's the dynamic relationship. That's the reason you can receive this all in vain. So they can go out there and preach against sin. They can preach a duty-bound message. They can tell the people that are going to hell if they keep practicing their, their filth and their disgusting behavior in their lives. But it's all in vain because they receive the grace of God to, what's this word mean? To no effect, without purpose. That's what in vain means.